Hey y'all, it's Dr. Gibbs again. I'm so excited to be here with you guys. And today, what I wanna talk about is this phenomenon of revenge procrastination. Um, so very quickly, if you're listening to this and you're not a physician, please keep in mind, scientific proof is not nearly as black and white as people think. And in order to make treatment decisions for individual people, sometimes we have to consider evidence that's not nearly as absolute as we would like. So this is not meant to be medical advice and you should consult your own physician for any medical issues or diagnoses you may have. All right, so what is revenge procrastination and why is this important? Well, I just heard about this term a few weeks ago and as a procrastinator myself, I was naturally interested. So um, after looking it up, as far as I can tell, the term originated in China where um, there's something called a 996 work schedule. And what that apparently is, is that uh, people work 12 hours a day, nine to nine um, and six days a week. So that's 12 hours a day, six days a week. So 72 hour work week, which is basically two full-time employee um, hours worth of work. Um, and so those folks uh, don't feel in control of their own time or their life. So they carve out their social time or their social media time um, when they know they ought to be sleeping and staying awake as late as 2 a.m. on a pretty regular basis. Um, but I have to tell you that that schedule is actually pretty easy and gentle compared to all the medical residents, uh, surgical residents, and many attending physicians' work schedules as well. So as physicians, um, and especially those of us who grew up in the before the 80-hour work week, so ha-ha, 80 hours right there, um, we were working more like six to nine, seven days a week or worse during residency. And the, the bad thing is that some docs continue to work very full and hectic schedules particularly women physicians or single parents who work extended schedules and then feel like they have to come home and have little or no help managing their household and their kids. Um, and then when it's finally time to go to sleep, you're tired and wired. Um, and you feel like you need some social time, some unwind time, some, some um, you know, you know, not necessarily working out, um, but, you know, some screen time, some um, Facebook time, whatever, maybe even a little nightcap or two to help you sleep, help you get sleepy. So the bottom line is that this phenomenon is just sleep procrastination by people who don't feel like they have control of their own time. All right. So you guys have all heard the old adage, I'll sleep when I'm dead. You heard that before, right? Okay. Okay. So as you've probably guessed by now, tonight's topic is about sleep and sleep, sleep deprivation. And by the end of this, I really hope to convince you why we should all really want to optimize our sleep um, and why this macho attitude is really deadly and not just in the context of motor vehicles. Um, but but what is it? What is sleep? So as recently as 25 years ago, researchers didn't really know. And they would glibly answer, oh, well, it's for getting rid of sleepiness. But really, at, at that point, what sleep really did for us was pretty unknown. Um, and we all looked for ways around it. And even world leaders would brag, foolishly, as you'll see, about needing little of it. Um, but the breakthroughs that are coming up more recently tell us what's really happening um, and have really come about in the last 20-ish or so years. And it really turns out that it's likely not a coincidence that Ronald Reagan and Man Mag Maggie Thatcher, to name a few, both died of Alzheimer's disease after a lifetime of bravado about really not needing any sleep. Um, and it's really an epidemic now, right along with obesity. And, um, and you'll see a little bit later why one of those things mean, uh, means that they're really likely even connected. So 
one study that I read, uh, about two thirds of adults throughout the developed nations failed to obtain the recommended eight hours of nightly sleep. Um, and in the US now the average, average meaning half the people are worse than this, get six and a half hours sleep. So um, before we really look at sleep procrastination, um, let's look a little bit at why do we sleep? Well, all species need sleep. Um, sleep conveys such a powerful evolutionary survival advantage that it makes up for basically being unconscious a third of the time. And that's in all animal species, not just humans. Um, and as new research has emerged, so has the realization that sleep is really the single most effective thing we can do to reset and optimize our brain and body health each day. Um, so another version of sleep procrastination that I didn't mention before is um, people who get up and go to the gym at 4.30 in the morning. Well, that's nice if you went to bed at eight o'clock, but if you didn't go to bed till 11, you're actually not helping yourself. Um, anyway, and we'll see a little bit why in a minute. Um, but being awake results in oxi oxidative stress in our brains, um, which produces um, free radicals that cause damage. Um, they can cause neuronal energy deprivation and cell death. Um, and clearing away those toxins out of your brain is just one of the many benefits that um, researchers have found for what sleep does. Um, but let's look at how sleep procrastination can not only harm your health in the long run, but can really be deadly. Um, so low performance ability, so quicker onset of physical exhaustion, collapse of concentration and decision-making, um, increases in reaction times. So in controlled studies of sleep deprivation, four hours of sleep for six nights reveal uh, yields as poor performance on concentration tests as somebody who's been awake 24 hours straight. And all of us who are in medicine have been awake at least 24 hours straight at some time. I mean, we used to do shifts that were 24 on, 24 off, that turned out to be more like 27 on and 24 off. And a lot of us have done um, 48 hours straight awake, and, and we know how ridiculous it makes you feel. Uh, but they've shown now that four hours of sleep for six nights reveals as poor a performance on concentration tests as somebody who's been awake for 24 hours solid. And by 11 days of this four hours a night, they were as bad as someone who was awake for 48 hours. And even more worrisome to me is that 10 days of only six hours of sleep per night was also as bad as somebody going 24 hours without sleep. Um, and the performance show, uh, scores show that there was really no sign of leveling out um, as the participants continued at these levels of sleep for longer and longer until the experiments were finally discontinued. So their performance continued to decline. And furthermore, the people were acclimating to that low level of alertness and impaired performance. And that became their accepted norm without them even realizing that they were impaired compared to their normal um, fully slept baseline, which is wild to me. It's just like, oh my gosh. So people don't even realize how poorly they're performing. But anyway, so um, one of the quotes that I found was that fatigue degrades a person's ability to stay awake, alert, and attentive to the demands of controlling their vehicle safely. Now, this is about driving. Um, and to make matters worse, the fatigue impairs our ability to judge how fatigued we really are. And drowsy driving is a huge, huge problem. So it now kills more Americans than DWIs involving alcohol and drugs combined. So the yearly number of fatalities from sleepy driving is now in the hundreds, that's, this is fatalities, hundreds of thousands. And there are now 1.2 million auto crashes per year attributable to lack of sleep. Um, 
And I hesitate to even call these accidents because they're completely preventable. Um, and actually falling asleep at the wheel really account for only a minority of these incidents. Um, so falling asleep at the wheel is somebody who's acutely sleep deprived. And, and by that, uh, I mean, awake more than 16 hours. That's now the definition, um, which for doctors was all of us, basically. Um, the more insidious problem then is the problem with being that chronically underslept by as little as two hours per night for a week. So averaging less than seven hours per night. Um, and, and even I've had this happen where I'm just driving along and my head nods or snaps back while I'm in the car. Um, or I just all of a sudden hit a bump and whoop and, oh, I'm headed for the curb. Here we go. Um, but anyway, so this phenomenon is called micro sleep. And this is your eyelids partly closed. You become unaware of your surroundings for a few to several seconds and you just don't react um, until something jars you out of it. So these cause a particular pattern of accidents, no brakes, no skidding, no attempt to correct the steering before impact. And the NTSB analyzes these and they tend to be more deadly than drunk driving accidents where the intoxicated driver reacts, but just too late because people who are doing micro sleep don't react. Anyway, so let's look at a couple more headline grabbing sleep loss caused incidents that we've all heard of. So uh, Chernobyl, anyone? Um, that was a nuclear reactor meltdown, meltdown with thousands of fatalities. Um, and sleep deprived operators on an extended shift made ex uh, fatal errors at 1 a.m. How about the Exxon Valdez? We've all heard of that. Prince William Sound in Alaska, 1989. 40 million gallons of crude oil spilled. Um, the intoxicated captain had turned navigation over to the third mate, but he had only had six hours of sleep in the prior 48. Um, here's another one, Colgan Air Flight 3407, Newark to Buffalo, that was in 2009. 49 crew and passenger fatalities and four injured on the ground and one fatality. Um, the Metro North Hudson Rail Line derailment in 2013, um, the train entered a curve three times the speed limit, four fatalities, six injured. The engineer said he went into a daze and lost situational their awareness. Well, it was later determined that he had chronic sleep problems. But it's not just auto accidents. Um, what about your job performance? I mean, you know, these Chinese people that were mentioned in this study have these jobs and they're all, you know, hustling, trying to get ahead. But, um, but these low sleep levels, even six hours a night, causes collapses in your job performance because it impairs your job, your decision making, your efficiency, your problem solving, um, collapses your concentration. It really degrades your fact based learning. I don't know if anybody here has ever pulled an all nighter. Um, I know I certainly have. Um, and it really impairs your, I mean, you can't remember the next day, the stuff you stayed up all night to remember. Um, anyway, decreased mental performance and stamina. And then these other things that really impair your ability to perform in the workplace, uncontrolled emotional liability, impulsivity, perception of threats really increases. Empathy really decreases. And then there's earlier onset of anxiety and panic. Um, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't want my doctors um, making medical decisions on my behalf um, when they are in that uh, kind of a scenario. Um, and, and remember, these insufficiently slept people are consistently not able to accurately gauge their own poor performance. Um, okay, so what else does insufficient sleep do? So new links are being discovered every year with chronic diseases and in insufficient sleep. And really no brain or body system is, um, is completely unaffected at this point. So they're deciding that as little restriction as six hours a night increases cardiac risk over a lifetime by five times on average. Um, so healthy, this was a study that they did, healthy middle-aged patients with no sign of coronary calcification 
are 300 percent more likely to have developed it after five years of chronic five to six hour sleep habit um, and um, bowel breast and prostate cancer um, are all increased in people who sleep se less than seven hours a night um, as much as double um, also one even one night of four hours of sleep decreases your circulating immune cells that fight cancer by 70 percent seven zero seventy percent um anyway and when averaging six hours a night versus eight um your cortisol levels rise your insulin resistance rises and that has um some distressing results if you go on a diet 70 percent of your weight loss is going to be from your lean muscle mass rather than your fat um, underslept people consume on average 300 more calories per day and choose high carb and sweets rather than healthy alternatives. And they've done these in basically, I mean, you can't blind the studies, but you can randomize them. You can say, okay, group A and group B, you go, you know, go sleep now and then come to the dinner table and take whatever you want. And then they measure them and then they swap the groups and then they do the same study again. And it's really, really remarkable. But they've also noticed that leptin goes down and ghrelin goes up. Those are the hormones that make you hungry or not hungry. Um, um, also, here's another one that's very interesting. Your testosterone levels and your reproductive ability will be equivalent to someone 10 years older than you are. Um, for men, that results in decreased testicular size, decreased sperm counts, and re decreased sperm mobility. Um, and then we also talked about that compromised immune system um, in uh, the cancer fighting, but it also compromises your ability to respond to a vaccine or to fight off an infection. Um, and then here's the one that scared me the most. So remember that oxidative stress that I was talking about earlier, sleep, um, that, that accumulates while you're awake and then sleep help, helps clear it up. Well, Alzheimer's disease is associated with the buildup of these toxic proteins called beta amyloid and tau. Um, and the first affected, the first cells that are affected are the cells of the hippocampus which are responsible for memory and learning. Um, and also then um, are affected are the frontal cortex cells where deep sleep is generated. So not sleeping comes back to bite you by impairing your ability to sleep. Oh my gosh. So um, it starts way younger than you think. And then about nine years ago, it was discovered that glial cells, which are the neuronal supporting cells, shrink by three times during deep non-REM sleep open channels that allow flushing out of the beta amyloid and the tau. Um, and that only happens in deep non-REM sleep, which is what gets cut off when you don't go to bed until 2 a.m. Um, and if you check a PET scan on somebody with a lifetime of sleeping less than seven hours a night on average, they show much higher levels of these toxins than people who sleep more than seven hours on average regardless of whether the people themselves judge that they have been getting adequate sleep or not. Um, and then human studies really showed circulating tau and beta amyloid um, increases dramatically after one night of no deep sleep. So sleep deficiency is now known to be the most important lifestyle factor in determining Alzheimer's risk um, ahead of diet and exercise ahead of. All right. So seven plus hours a night of regular sleep during adult life throughout adult life reduces Alzheimer's risk by at least a third compared to those who get less. Um, and it's also notable that APOE4, now this is a gene marker that you can test. It's a blood test um, that confers really high risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and it can be measured in your blood, but it does not confer increased risk unless it is accompanied by elevated blood pressure. And guess what else low sleep does? It is um, a symptom of chronic sleep loss. So here's the deal. If I told you that I had a drug 
that would en enhance your ability to learn new material, improve your retention, enhance your decision-making ability, your problem solving, your creativity, your motor skills, your muscle memory development, your reaction times, your athletic performance. If I told you I had a drug that would increase your charisma, attractiveness, and leadership ability, would you buy it? Would you pay money for it? What about if it also boosted your metabolism and reduced your appetite, helped you lose fat and retain muscle while dieting, um, improved your ability to fight off diseases like colds and flu by three times as much, decrease your perception of pain, recharge your immune system, elevate your mood, reduce your anxiety and depression, decrease your cancer risk or help you fight it if you already had it. Decrease your heart attack risk by 50%. Decrease your Alzheimer's risk by 35 to 60%. Decrease your diabetes risk. Would you buy this drug? Would you pay a lot of money for it? I would. What if it had no adverse side effects? What if I told you it was easy to get, legal, even pleasurable? How much would you pay for this drug? And yet, we all do this. We all short ourselves on sleep. And it is really, really not a great thing to do. Um, all right. So I want to go into a couple of other little things. So some fun facts about your circadian rhythm. So um, circadian rhythm is the pressure that you feel to fall asleep during any particular point in your 24 hour day and night. And melatonin is the chemical that your brain makes at the time, at the right time to sleep. Um, and the regular use of artificial light, particularly LEDs like phones and iPads, computers, TVs, can reset your circadian clock and delay the onset of melatonin secretion and sleepiness by 90 minutes after your exposure um, to those light sources ends. So this reset persists for days after the exposure and results in insufficient total sleep and insufficient REM sleep. And melatonin secretion is so sensitive that turning on a strong light in the night can decrease your blood levels in seconds to minutes. So this can, can, can pose difficulty in falling back asleep, even if you were already asleep. Um, all right, well, here's another one. What is adenosine? Adenosine is the chemical that builds up in your brain and creates what the scientists call sleep pressure. So the longer you've been awake, the more adenosine you have in your brain and the sleepier you feel. Um, and sleeping scrubs the adenosine out of your system over time. So insufficient sleep leaves some of yesterday's adenosine to make you feel sleepy in the morning. Um, generally need eight to nine hours of sleep to get rid of all the adenosine. Um, typically 14 hours awake causes a sufficient buildup of adenosine to result in healthy sleepiness. And then after 16 hours of being awake, that sleep pressure can start building up to these dangerous performance impairing levels. Um, so the balance of the two factors, the adenosine, the melatonin, and the circadian rhythm really dictates how sleepy or how alert you're going to be at any given time of day and when you're going to feel tired and how well you sleep. Um, so if you sleep at 2 a.m. and then you say, oh, I don't have to get up until 8 or 9, but it gets light at 5.30, you are not going to get the amount of quality sleep. Even though you got a sort of okay-ish amount of sleep, let me say two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's six hours. But, um, you know, we just talked about how six hours isn't all that red hot. Um, but if half of those are against your circadian rhythm, then you're not getting the deep sleep. You're not getting the REM. You're not getting the deep sleep. So anyway, there is no sleep bank. So you don't, you can't store it up. You can't catch up on the weekends. It really it may feel like you can, but you really, really just don't overcome that damage. Anyway, okay, well, what about caffeine? I can stay awake if I take caffeine. Well, I can't, but um, anyway, caffeine 
is an addictive stimulant that blocks brain receptors for adenosine. That's how it works. But it does not prohibit it from building up. It blocks it, but it doesn't take it away. And the half-life of caffeine is about seven hours. And a typical cup of coffee has, what, 300 milligrams of caffeine. Um, and even decaf has some. So while it can temporarily improve alertness, chronic use of caffeine results in even more chronic sleep insufficiency. And so if you're staying up late and you're drinking coffee to stay awake, it is just perpetuating this problem. Even in persons who feel like they sleep fine on caffeine, the quality and the depth of their sleep are impaired if you measure it. Um, and then caffeine is also a diuretic, which leaves you more vulnerable to waking up at night because you have to go pee. Um, all right, well, how about naps? They can help a little. So a 90 minute nap is shown to replenish the capacity for fact-based learning, get it up 40% higher than that severely sleep impaired person, but not all the way back to baseline. Um, and studies do show that the best time to take a nap is if you know you're gonna have to be awake for a really, really long time, if you'll take a nap early in your duty cycle, um, that's the best thing you can do to avoid extreme fatigue and pre preserve your alertness. But that does not get rid of all the other um, long-term sleep deprivation uh, bad effects that we talked about. And really 20 minutes is the very minimum amount of a nap that's been shown to do anything. Um, but neither naps nor caffeine can salvage those higher level brain functions, including the learning, the memory, the emotional stability, um, the complex reasoning and the decision-making. So um, next week, I think I might talk a little bit about what to do if you can't sleep. Um, but truthfully, I've been going on for half an hour already. So I think I'm going to call it a night. Um, and we can talk again about um, what to do if you really feel like you can't sleep or um, if, um, you've been having trouble getting enough sleep, um, what you can do about that. So that's it for now. I'm Dana Gibbs, MD. I'm an integrative physician in North Texas, and I help people address their thyroid and other hormone imbalances. So if you have a question you want to see addressed on a future live session, you can email me at drgibbs, that's Dr. Gibbs at danagibbsmd.com. And if you're a thyroid and chronic fatigue sufferer in North Texas and you want a caring doctor to finally help you resolve your exhaustion, joint and muscle aches, poor sleep issues, come sign up for a new patient evaluation with me now at www.danagibbsmd.com. And I'll talk to you guys again next week. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.